Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Science and Technology Q&A for kids and others. I am unfortunately a bit under the weather today. I am so proud of not having gotten sick for a whole three years. I think it's the longest time in my life when I have uh, not once gotten sick, but I seem to have some kind of uh, developing cold. Um, and uh, so I'm a bit under the weather and maybe less coherent than usual. We'll see. Maybe I'll talk less quickly. I don't know. Um, Talking about the weather, I see there's a question here from Ruth, who asks, how do tornadoes form? Hmm. Well, let's see. I think the, the first thing to do is to explain what a tornado is. A tornado is a kind of a vortex in a fluid. What's happening is that the, the, the air is going around in a circle, and it's going around very quickly. Sometimes it can approach, I think, the speed of sound. Um, going going around in that circle. Um, but the point is that once you've set up a vortex that's kind of going around in a circle in a fluid, whether it's water or air, it's kind of hard for that circular motion to dissipate because it's kind of a little bit like, imagine you've got pieces of the air or the water that are going around and it's kind of like, like you've got a piece of string and it's wrapped around a pencil and it's wrapped around and you can't, that there's sort of no way to, the, the two sides of the string, there's no way to kind of get them to merge. The two sides are that, that even if they're sort of close to each other across the pencil, that one is going one way, the other's going the other way. They don't, there's, there, there, there isn't, there, there's sort of a stability to that, that um, exists as a result of essentially for, essentially for reasons of sort of topology, that's just like the fact that if you, if you um, uh, wrap a string around a pencil, you can't, when you pull the ends, the string doesn't un, un, unwrap, so to speak. Now, the question is, how does the air get to be going in that circular motion? I think the answer is, I think, more or less this. Um, so the first thing is that there is a general process of air kind of circulating around in the atmosphere. There, there's several different things that lead to that. Um, the, the most obvious one is that hot air rises, cold air sinks, and so you end up getting these kind of cells where there's hot air rising, cold air going down, and that produces this kind of circular motion in, uh, in the air. Why does the hot air rise? It rises because when the air is hot, the molecules are running around faster. That's what it means to be hot. And so the, um, uh, the, for, for a given volume of air, at, uh, uh, the, the, um, uh, there are, the, the density of the air is lower. There are fewer molecules that are needed to support a certain pressure because the molecules are running around faster. So when they hit the walls of something, or it isn't really walls in the case of the atmosphere, but when they hit other parts of the air, the fact that they're running around faster means that their pressure is higher, um, even though there aren't, uh, and you can have fewer molecules still exerting the same pressure. And so when, when the air is hotter, the, the, uh, the density of the air, the number of molecules uh, in every cubic meter or whatever will go down. And that means there's a, that, that means that the, the air will, that air will kind of float on top of the air that has a higher density, because that's a, a general feature of things that things that are, uh, have higher density go, go lower under gravity and so on. And so what's happening is you end up with a situation where as the air is, uh, the hot air rises, then it cools down when it's, when it's higher up and then it falls again and it goes in the cycle, the circular kind of cycle. And I think what happens is that in things like thunderstorms, you end up getting these kind of cells, uh, convection cells, um, that uh, are initially kind of going up down. But I think as a result of the winds and so on in the thunderstorm, they get turned so that they end up being uh, having the circular motion. But the circular motion is now, uh, you know, circles uh, going sort of flat to the ground, so to speak. And I think that's how... Um, uh, that's the that's the primary way that you end up getting these sort of rapidly rotating uh, columns of air that are what uh, what correspond to tornadoes, and I think um, the uh, th there's a different mechanism for circulation in the air. Uh, generally, cyclones, high pressure regions, low pressure regions. Th that's on a much larger scale, many miles across, and those are the things that are closer to what lead to hurricanes and so on. Where what happens is in the, um, uh, let's see, in the Northern Hemisphere, 
uh, these things rotate in one direction in the southern hemisphere in the other direction. Um, this is a result of uh, forces that, that are associated with the rotation of the Earth and the effect, so-called Coriolis force, that has an effect on uh, when, when, when something is moving, uh, when, you, when you're trying to move something on the rotating Earth, there will be a sort of a, a uh, there'll be a sort of a, a force that's associated with the rotation of the Earth that will tend to make the thing sort of curl around ultimately in a circle. So, you know, the place where this is, uh, people, you know, notice this, if you're, if you're doing something, you know, it's noticed, uh, well, back in the, certainly in the 1800s, probably 1700s as well, um, people who were, you know, doing artillery shelling, and, you know, you're trying to, you're trying to, you know, sort of attack people by, by firing an artillery shell high up, and it goes several miles, let's say. And the issue is that, as the thing is, when, when the thing is sort of going up, the earth is rotating from under, underneath it. And that means that as the, the, you have this force that's causing the thing to sort of not go straight and it ends up being, uh, you know, having, having a, a, a sort of distorted trajectory relative to, the, uh, relative to, you know, the people who are sort of on the ground moving with the rotation of the earth. So anyway, that, that's, um, and I think once, um, once tornadoes have formed, there's this rotating vortex of air, um, and there tends to be, if that vortex is kind of all up in the air, you see these kind of funnel cloud type things where, where, the, where you see the kind of the, the rotation of, um, of, of the air. Now, now, typically those funnel clouds look pretty dark. Um, I think the reason they look dark is because they have lots of water vapor in them. They're kind of, they look dark for the same reason that thunder clouds and so on look dark. Uh, you know, a, a, something will look dark if light can't get through it, so to speak, from from the sky or the sun, and uh, that happens uh, when there's when there's a high density of water vapor um, in in the thing. I think that's why the, those 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 things look look darker. Um, but then what happens is the thing is twisting around, and it doesn't have very much resistance to its twisting because all that's resisting it is the air. But as soon as it touches down on the ground. It's this this air that's trying to turn around is trying to you know churn up the ground, and the ground is will resist very strongly being churned up, and so that tends to dissipate the the tornado as soon as it's kind of touched down. It will lose energy because it's it's kind of like friction operating on the on this rotating column of air. Let's see. So that was uh, a little bit on that. Let's see. We have a question here from X. Why does a fan create white noise? Okay, so, uh, all right. So first, first question is, what is white noise? So when you, uh, you when you make a sound, um, uh, it would be something like you know you make a hissing sound. Um, what um, that that. Uh, th there's a the question of uh, what frequency is that sound. So, so for example, if you play a note on a piano, let's say you play middle C, it's 256 vibrations per second, roughly, is the middle C note. That's the mo that's the main uh, frequency of middle C. It has some additional ones at twice that, three times that, etc., 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 four times that, and so on. Um, but uh, the the main frequency. That you get from the vibration of the string that corresponds to the middle C string is about 256 hertz, depending on exactly how you tuned your piano. But when the the normally when you're playing notes on a musical instrument, the idea is the note has a definite frequency, more or less. It'll have some extra harmonics of that frequency and things, but more or less it has a dominant frequency that is, let's say, 256 hertz, 440 hertz for middle A. You know, 512 hertz for the for the C above middle C, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So mostly with a musical instrument, it's just like there's a definite there's a definite frequency. Well, now imagine that you played all the notes on a piano together. Well, then you'd have all these different frequencies. It'll sound pretty terrible. But that what you can ask is uh, sort of what is the distribution of frequencies that you hear. So playing all the notes in a piano, you would have, you know, each note, there are 12 notes in an octave, 12 semitones in an octave. So each note has a slightly different frequency. You'd see all these kind of frequency spikes from all those different notes. But now let's imagine that instead of doing that, that you had some process where instead of it producing spikes at every note, 
it was just a, a continuous range of frequencies. That's kind of what white noise is. White noise is like playing on an infinite piano. So it's a piano with, with sort of uh, infinitely finely gradated notes. You'd be playing all the notes together. So that there's, there's a uh, uh, frequency, there's, there's sound being produced at all those frequencies. Um, now, okay, so why does that happen in, uh, uh, when you have a fan or something? Actually, a fan is not exactly white noise. I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, the main thing that's producing that noise is fluid turbulence. And so what happens there? Well, when you have a fluid, could be air, could be water, it flows around an obstruction. When the fluid is flowing slowly, it just sort of slides around the obstruction. So you, you have your, you know, your, your, your thing in the water and you can kind of see if you, if you put like ink in the water or something, you'll see that it, it smoothly, you know, the ink, kind of the trail of ink smoothly slides around the object that you put into the water. That's if the water is going slowly. As the water starts going more quickly, it, that gets more complicated. And instead of just sliding smoothly, what will happen is behind the object, you'll start seeing the thing curling up. It'll start making little vortices, actually. The first thing it does is to, let's say your object is like a, a, a plate or something, uh, or, a, or a, 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 a disc, let's say. Um, behind the object, you'll start seeing little vortices, first made at one side, then made at the other side. You'll see this kind of street of vortices form behind the object. If you keep cranking up the speed even more, those vortices will start interacting with each other. It'll start looking a bit more complicated, and eventually it'll sort of go to hell and it'll look very complicated. There'll be a complicated turbulent wake behind the object. So that phenomenon of uh, fluids becoming sort of random looking when they flow quickly, that's a very core phenomenon in fluid dynamics, the phenomenon of turbulence. The, the other kind of sort of smoothly sliding flow is called laminar flow. And there's this transition from laminar flow to turbulent flow that happens when there's a, a certain speed of flow relative to the size of the object and so on characterized by I think called the Reynolds number, which is uh, essentially a, a ratio of um, the, uh, let's see, LV divided, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, the, it's um, uh, the, 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 the size times the velocity divided by essentially the, um, uh, uh, how, how viscous the fluid is, how kind of, um, uh, how much the fluid tends to damp out uh, kind of um, uh, sort of, flow in the fluid because you know if you start a fluid flowing even even if you start off a vortex eventually the vortex will die down because there's kind of friction in the fluid that's causing that that the the momentum in that vortex to gradually be degraded so okay so then okay so what really happens in turbulence why does turbulence happen well i think we can fairly say nobody really completely knows why turbulence happens there isn't really a, a, a slam dunk. This is a simple explanation. There are complicated equations that describe the flow of fluids, things called the Navier-Stokes equations. They're complicated partial differential equations. They're super hard to solve. When you try and solve them on a computer, they tend to have the feature that as you sort of put them on a computer, they're no longer representing a continuous fluid. They're, they're discretized because the computer is digital and discrete. And you end up getting these little errors because of the discretization of the um, uh, of um, uh, of of those sort of of that kind of conceptual fluid, and those um, and and it's very hard to tell whether if you see in a in a simulation on a computer if you see the fluid kind of getting really random, it's very hard to tell whether that randomness is coming from an actual phenomenon about the fluid or whether it's coming from something that went wrong in the scheme that you use to discretize the equations that represented the fluid. Now, actually, I myself back in the 1980s tried to untangle this question and figure out where does the randomness in, in turbulent flow really come from? Um, the answer, I think, is it's a, it's a very computational process. It's kind of you're seeing sort of one of the, one of the big things that, that I discovered in the, in the early 1980s is this phenomenon that even very simple programs even like little tiny programs that just are specified by very simple rules, even those tiny programs can produce very complicated behavior. It's kind of analogous to the story of, you know, you've got the digits of pi, you've got a little program that says it's pi, it's the ratio of the circumference to diameter of a circle. Yet once you actually run that program, you get 3.14159, et cetera, you get the seemingly random sequence of digits. 
And so it's the same type of thing that in these simple programs, it's sort of routine to get very complicated behavior. And it's sort of the, the, the key phenomenon is this phenomenon I call computational irreducibility. The fact that there's a sort of irreducible amount of computation that goes into generating that output. And it's sort of irreducibly difficult for us to recognize regularities in that output. And I think that's ultimately the core phenomenon that leads to fluid turbulence is it's a place where you get to see that fluids really do computation. That really what's happening is there's a lot of computation going on in the motion of the fluid. And we get to see that that computation is kind of irreducible and complicated and we can't sort of reduce it and say it's obvious it's gonna do this. That's why it looks random to us. And I think that's the ultimate origin of fluid turbulence. Um, but that's a thing, it's, it's very hard to, to nail down all the details of that. And actually, I happen to be working on something somewhat related to that right now. But um, the uh, uh, back to sort of, uh, you know, the, the noise made by a turbulent fluid. So what happens is when the fluid flows around an obstacle, it makes a great big eddy a great big vortex, typically. The, the first thing that happens is there's a big flow of fluid, let's say water, air, air in the case of the, the fan noise. Uh, it flows around the object and um, uh, it's kind of, it, it kind of careens around it and makes this big circular eddy behind the object. Okay, so then what happens is that uh, the, a, a basic phenomenon, not 100% well understood, is that in turbulence, big eddies get ground down to smaller eddies. There's a whole cascade of eddies. Big eddies turn into smaller eddies, which turn into still smaller eddies, usually called the Kolmogorov cascade. Um, it was uh, uh, kind of first talked about in the 1940s, I guess. Um, and uh, the, um, so there's this phenomenon, you know, at first the fluid is, is making this big eddy and then the big eddy breaks down to smaller and smaller eddies. And one of the things that happens is that the big eddy has a lot of momentum, a lot of angular momentum that's, that's you know, the fluid is flowing around in the circle and it keeps going and so on. But as the eddy gets smaller and smaller, the forces of viscosity, the kind of the, uh, uh, the resistance to flow of a fluid gets more and more significant. And so when the, when the vortex is, when the eddy is broken down into a tiny eddy, it's dissipated away by viscosity. So the basic picture of fluid turbulence is you start off with these big eddies, they get broken down into smaller eddies, and eventually, when the eddies get small enough, those eddies get kind of absorbed and, and they kind of goes to just uh, stationary flow. And so that's kind of the picture. So now, how do you make sound? Well, when these eddies are there, they are, uh, when, it's, when, when you have these eddies in air, uh, you know, sound is compression waves in air. And these eddies produce sounds that are of comparable wavelength to the eddies themselves. So when you have eddies of a certain size, you, it's producing a sound. So like, like when, you, when you pluck a string, for example, you'll get a sound that whose wavelength is, let's say, predominantly the, the length of the string, and, um, and, that, uh, and that, that determines its frequency, uh, depends on speed of sound and speed, speed of, uh, uh, well, sound in the material and so on. But um, the, uh, the thing here is that little eddy of a certain size will produce a sound whose wavelength is comparable to the size of the eddy. So, okay, so what's the big picture? The big picture is big eddy is made, it produces a sound that's very long wavelength. So it's very low sound, you know, blah, 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 low, low sound. Then as the eddies get smaller and smaller, um, they produce higher and higher pitched sounds because their wavelength is smaller and smaller, their frequency is higher and higher. And so then the question is in this cascade, what sounds are, uh, what, what's the distribution of sounds that are produced? So I mentioned that white noise corresponds to having an equal amount of sound being produced at every different frequency. Um, in the case of, of fluid turbulence, it isn't an equal amount of, of uh, eddies at all sizes. There's a distribution of sizes of eddies. It's actually in, in the, the math of it is it's a K to the minus five thirds law, roughly. At least that's the sort of theoretical prediction that the um, uh, the eddies, as they get smaller, there are progressively more eddies um, by a, a factor of um, you know uh, the 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 eddy size to the power one point six ish. So um, the uh, uh, so that means that the the distribution of frequencies is determined by that law. That's the distribution of frequencies of things that come out from uh, uh, from a turbulent fluid. Now, you know, we have a very 
uh, uh, sort of human example of turbulent fluid flow, which is some letters that we say, like the letter S. The letter S involves turbulent flow of air in our mouths. Um, and uh, that's a, uh, and you can hear the kind of hissing sound, which comes because there's a whole range of frequencies. Um, that's the sort of characteristic sound that something like white noise makes. There's this whole range of frequencies that's being produced. Uh, other letters like vowels and things like that tend to have a very definite, uh, more definite frequency that that comes about from from the uh, uh, from the flow of air in, in our throats and so on. Uh, usually, most most vowels the the frequency changes over time as you as you're going from the beginning of the vowel to the end of the vowel and so on. But um, uh, but things like s's make uh, come from the the hissing sound comes from turbulent flow. Okay, back to fans. So what's happening in a fan is the blades are going fast enough that you have turbulent flow. Now, if you have a, one of those ceiling fans that's just ambling around, you probably don't have turbulent flow. That's probably laminar flow. But as soon as you have kind of a rapidly rotating fan, you'll have turbulent flow. Um, and, uh, and that turbulent flow will lead to this cascade of eddies, and those eddies will produce these sounds. Now, okay, so what's the end result? We could actually compute what the frequency spectrum of the sound should be based on turbulent flow, and it's not flat like white noise. Um, instead, it will be uh, it will have a distribution of frequencies. It's usually called pink noise. So why, why is it called white, pink, etc.? Well, if we were looking at light, then different colors correspond to different frequencies of light. And so when uh, white light is a combination of the colors all the way from the blue end of the spectrum to the red end of the spectrum. And so when we say white, it's like we're, we're combining all those colors together. For us, perceptually, us humans, perceptually, we can get white light without combining all the colors of the of the spectrum, um, because we only have we're only sampling the spectrum at three places because we have three kinds of cone cells in our eyes, and so you know LED lights, for example, don't produce a, a flat spectrum. They don't really produce white light. They produce perceptual white light for us humans. But you know, if we were mantis shrimps or something, we'd have a lot more kinds of color receptors. The mantis shrimp will be saying, "That's not a white L L LCD display. That's that's an LCD display with, you know, with with these specific colors, and and it's not white." But for us humans, we can get away with just having uh, light at, at particular frequencies. But the full kind of version of white light, which is also what the sun produces and hot objects produce, is this whole spectrum goes across the rainbow, so to speak, and that's why it's called white light. And white noise is kind of the analogous thing for sound. So pink noise is, is noise where there's sort of more at the red end of the spectrum, more at the low frequencies than there is at the high frequencies. And um, uh, you can also have blue noise and things like this. Uh, somewhat confusingly, there's a thing called brown noise, um, and that uh, which has a frequency spectrum that goes like one over the frequency squared. And um, uh, that it's called that because it is the noise associated with Brownian motion, associated with random walks, I have that kind of noise. But that's that brown is not it's not you know it's not a color word like the other ones. But anyway, so I think fans typically produce some kind of pink noise um, that isn't a flat spectrum, um, and it's probably the same kind of spectrum that you would get in you know if you look at a spectrogram for the letter S, for example, you'll probably see a somewhat similar uh, frequency spectrum. So that's 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 the story of that. Um, let's see. Uh, um, Memes is asking, how did they produce the audio from? The galaxy's supermassive black hole. I do not know. Uh, you know, it's always a challenge to take things which are not really very, you know, human familiar, and make them uh, sort of uh, such that humans can can understand what's going on. I mean, this is the whole story of kind of visualization, or the whole sort of parallel track of sonification. You know, the the idea of sonification is there are things where you say, "I've got a picture. I understand what's going on." Another one is just play me a sound and I'll understand what's going on. Sonification is generally much harder than visualization. It's uh, we've done even from uh, 
um, the actually version 1.2 of Wolfram Language back in 1989, we added in addition to the function plot that plots uh, a function, we also have a function play that will play a function. What does it mean play a function? Well, imagine that you've got a function that wiggles up and down and, and so on. Playing that function means make the loudspeaker cone on your computer wiggle up and down, just like your just like the function is wiggling up and down. Now, obviously, if you have to wiggle pretty fast to be able to produce a sound. So for example, as I was mentioning before, if you want to produce middle C as a sound, you've got to wiggle 256 times a second. Um, but so we have this idea of you can play a function. You can play and you, you might have some, and it's very easy to make very kind of special effects, weird, you know, science fiction-y kinds of sounds with play. It's kind of fun to play with, um, so to speak. Um, and, you know, take different functions, sine waves are good, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, combinations of those and so on to make all kinds of weird, weird sounds. Um, the question is, if you are trying to understand a piece of data, what can you do with sonification? How, how easy is it to understand something from the sound it makes? In my experience, it's pretty hard. Uh, you know, I have almost never found a really good use for sonification. You know, I, I don't know, I'm not sure I've, I, I must have heard the black hole sonification. Um, there are things where, uh, you know, for example, when it comes to things like, well, obviously when you get close to speech sounds and things, well then sonification is all great and we get to understand the language that's being said and so on. <coughs> but when we have, um, uh, uh, you know, other, other kinds of things, it's pretty hard for us to parse what they are. Um, and, you know, I think our brains in our ears, for example, we're very much set up to recognize particular frequencies of sound. And when we look at speech, the vowels, for example, have these, as I mentioned, these sort of particular frequency uh, ranges in them and so on. And, you know, in our inner ears, there's, it's kind of the inverse of having a plucked string where the string is vibrating, a, a string of a certain length vibrates at a certain frequency in our ears, the, the literally, if you if you undo the kind of organ of corti, which is the main main thing in our inner ears, um, it has little hair cells in it, and as the sound comes in, those hair cells wiggle. And what we're doing is we're looking at you know what is the frequency, what is the, what is the wavelength of that wiggling. So you know which pieces of that uh, actually there's a little bit of uh, it, it's more or less a standing wave, um, not quite, um, but. Uh, you know, which, which hair cells are wiggling, and that determines what frequency of sound you're hearing. And we are pretty well optimized. Uh, our auditory system is pretty well optimized for sort of telling apart things where there's a definite frequency of sound. There's a, like a, you know, there's this frequency, maybe there's a combination with one or two other frequencies, and we've got these sort of definite frequencies of sound. I think it's a little bit like in our visual system, when we look at a visual scene, one of the things that we most notice is the edges of things. And you know that's the kind of yes, it's you know there's a big blob of stuff. Maybe it's a cloud or something. What we really notice is the edges of the cloud, not the big blob in the middle. And I think that's the same type of thing that's happening in the auditory system, where we are noticing these kind of these discrete places where there's a sort of peak in the in the amount of uh, in the amount of sound at a particular frequency. And when it's a broader spectrum, it's very hard to tell what's going on. Um, I will say that. Uh, there are a lot of interesting dynamics of the inner ear. Uh, for example, you know there are certain kinds of of uh, notes when played together that that seem like they go together. Like you know you play middle C and you play uh, the note above middle C, and they they just go together very nicely. Um, and that's because in the wiggles that come from from the original middle C, the 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 note above middle C, an octave above middle C, has twice the wiggle rate. And so every sort of wiggle of the of the of the uh, uh, higher C note sort of fits perfectly within the wiggles of the of the lower C note. So there are other ones like a perfect fifth, um, which is uh, the um, uh, C and G, for example, um, being played together on 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 some musical instrument. Uh, what happens there is G is more or less three halves, one and a half times the frequency of C. 
it depends a little bit how things are tuned. There's a bunch of details there, but more or less it's three halves. And so again, the kind of wiggles of the G fit nicely with the wiggles of the C. Well, then there are other notes you can play, other combinations where they don't fit well at all. It's a big mess. And so there are, uh, let's see, there's one called a tritone, which is, what is that ratio? Oh, I forget. Um, but it's a, it's a very awkward ratio. It's not some nice round number. You play that note, it sounds terrible. It sounds very kind of uh, uh, ugly to most people. And I think there are, I had a theory at one point about why that was, and it had to do with the fact that you are generating on the auditory nerve. Okay, when, when you have these combinations of notes, the effective frequencies that are being produced are various combinations of the frequencies of those notes, the various arithmetic combinations of those frequencies. That's what happens in, in one of these systems where you've got these sort of sounds bouncing backwards and forwards. And I think one of the things that happens, you form, okay, so a typical thing is you form what are called beat notes. So, okay, so what happens with beat notes? The, the, if you have frequency of a note, it'll C or something like that, and then you play another note that is, instead of 256 hertz, it's 257 hertz. So it's really close to middle C. Most of the time, the wiggles in those two notes will line up perfectly, but they'll gradually get out of sync. So it'll gradually be the case that the, that the 257 hertz um, uh, vibrations per second um, note will gradually get out of sync, out of phase with the 256 hertz one. And what happens is eventually, it will get so out of phase that what's an up wiggle on the original note is a down wiggle on the slightly higher frequency note. But the what happens is that if the difference of frequencies is let's say one hertz, uh, 256 hertz versus 257 hertz, the the rate of sort of uh, you know the, the 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 rate at which you go from uh, everything lining up to everything anti aligning is uh, one hertz. It's the difference between those frequencies. So what you hear is something that goes, you know, I can't do it. I'm not gonna do that well. It basically, you hear, you hear the note sort of of a fixed frequency and then you hear it kind of fading and coming back and fading and coming back. So for example, back in the day when people use tuning forks to tune pianos and so on, what you would typically do is listen for beat notes. So you'd have your tuning fork it was a piece of metal that was vibrating at a particular frequency, and you'd tighten the strings in the piano or something like this until instead of hearing the thing going, you know, with a fading, et cetera, it was just that the time for each fade would get sort of infinitely long. And that meant that the frequencies were exactly agreeing. So the thing that, um, uh, so anyway, the, 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 what happens in the ear is when you play two different notes, you get these beat notes. You get these kind of combination frequency type things. And I think what happens is if you play sort of the, an ugly combination of notes, some of those beat notes that you get correspond to frequencies, I think around um, maybe 15 hertz or something, something like that. They're very low frequency, but they're, they're, they're a frequency that is a, like a super annoying frequency for the auditory nerve. And why is it super annoying? It's probably super annoying because the auditory nerve is using those frequencies as a way of encoding data. So it's kind of interfering with its way of transmitting data to your brain. And so that comes across as, hey, I don't like that type thing. So anyway, that, that's, um, that's kind of what happens in, um, uh, in, um, in that setup. How did I get off onto this topic? I'm, I'm now, I'm sorry, I've, I forgot. Oh yeah, we were talking about sonification and we were talking about um, how you can, you know, what you can recognize in sounds. And I think you can recognize very little other than a, a dominant frequency or a changing dominant frequency, those kinds of things that are a little bit like speech sounds. Um, by the time you've got some, I don't know, nested pattern of, of frequencies or something like this, it just sounds like white noise, basically. It doesn't sound uh, interesting. And, uh, so uh, that's why sonification is quite hard and, and often not a great way to, um, uh, to kind of communicate um, the uh, 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 sort of what's, what's in, in a piece of data. Now, I mean, there are fun things you can do, like we have a project called Wolfram Tones. You can find it on the, um, uh, 
um, on the web. Um, the uh, um, I'm very confused by a message I'm getting here about timing, which doesn't seem right at all. Um, the uh, uh, anyway, um, it's um, now it doesn't seem right at all. Um, the uh, in any case, um, uh, let's see, I lost my train of thought here. Um, that's what I get for uh, being distracted and being sick at the same time. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, we were talking about, um, oh, yes. Uh, uh, okay, so one thing you can do is sort of sonify things with notes. So, for example, we had this project called Wolfram Tones, which is a sonification of cellular automata, simple programs, sort of rendered as, uh, as musical notes. And essentially what we're doing there is uh, you have these, these simple programs and you can represent them visually as a bunch of black and white squares. You take that time series of black and white says going down the page, for example, you turn the page around you know, by 90 degrees, and then you have something that looks like kind of a musical score, where you've got these these uh, these black squares that are higher or lower, and you simply play that. And that's kind of interesting. That's definitely sort of musically interesting. How easy it is to kind of get a get an understanding of what's going on based on that, I'm not sure. So, you know, it's it's been a challenge, and I don't think it's, it's you know, people have talked about sonification for whew, years and years and years. And it's one of those things that isn't isn't quite here yet. Um, let's see. Ernesto is commenting, fans also generate different speed of flow radially as the linear speed is closer to the center than the outside. Yeah, I, I'm sure that's true, but I don't think that's, I think the dominant effect in making sounds is just turbulent flow. It's just the, the blades of the fan are just sort of cutting through the air and and making you know the the flow complicated and turbulent. Um, uh, let's see. Um, okay, Ernesto is commenting. I think they're actually trying to measure distortion of the gas. It seems like they actually measured managed to measure sound waves in distant gas. Look, I think you know whenever you have something that is kind of varying like a wave, um, then of course you can play it as a sound. So for example, gravitational waves, um, you can, uh, well, you know, mm, see the issue is in order to really have a convincing sound, you kind of have to hold a frequency for quite a while. It's no good to just have five wiggles because five wiggles, you're not going to hear them. What you're, what you're going to hear is hundreds and hundreds of wiggles that, um, you know, that you can kind of lock into over the course of, you know, a tenth of a second or something. You say, oh, yeah, that's a, that's a musical note. And maybe that musical note will change its frequency over time. But you kind of need to be able to lock into a definite frequency, I think. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, there's a question here. Um, <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Um, okay, there's a question here from Blank. Why are roads made of tarmac? Well, I mean, if you've driven on dirt roads, then, or been driven on dirt roads, uh, you kind of have some sense of what goes wrong with the roads. What tends to happen is that you get this effect where, where you have sort of the progressive bumps, this kind of washboard type effect where the, where the, where the thing that was kind of originally flat because sort of the, the car or something, it, it, it bounces up, it bounces down, and it's kind of grinding out the, um, the road in, in these ways where it sort of gradually, it, it kind of grinds out kind of a periodic pattern of what would end up being sort of kind of pothole-like things. And I think that's the main thing that one is trying to avoid is, you know, a, a kind of a, uh, if, if you've got a, um, uh, 
you know, when you have a road that starts to have uh, sort of bumps up and down, those bumps will be amplified by the way that, that you know, wheeled vehicles, for example, um, go over that, that road. It makes me interested to know, and I don't know the answer to this, I'm sure somebody does, when there were uh, paths that were primarily used by horses and didn't have any uh, wheeled vehicles and so on on them, I don't know whether the similar kind of uh, effect that you see on, on dirt roads and so on uh, occurred. But yeah, I think the main, main thing is that you want a, a kind of a hard surface that, is, um, that doesn't have the ability to be kind of eroded away in, in that fashion. And you know, it depends on what kind of a road, how, how, how heavy the, the stuff that's gonna be driving down the road or going on the road is. You know, something like a runway at an airport is, is very reinforced because you know, you've got a 200 ton plane that goes kathunk onto the runway and um, it, uh, you know, that puts a lot of force on it. And if it doesn't, if the, if the thing isn't well reinforced, that will end up sort of digging a hole in the runway, so to speak, which would be, which would be bad. Um, so I think that that's, uh, I think that's, that's the answer to that. Um, let's see. Oh, there's a question here about um, dark matter, dark energy. What is it? Um, let's say a little bit about that. So, you know, when we look out into the sort of astronomical world and the James Webb Telescope is producing really nice pictures, better pictures than ever before of sort of what's out there in the astronomical world, um, we see lots of things that are producing light. You know, the, the, the Webb Telescope um, it looks at infrared light, but generally it's light of some kind. Um, things that are luminous, things that are like stars, nebulas, things like that, where, where we're basically seeing light coming to us from those things. Sometimes the light will come directly from a star that's producing light. Sometimes it will be going through some cloud of dust or something, and the light will be changed by that. Sometimes there might be a gravitational lensing effect where, where the light is bent by the force of gravity around a galaxy or, or a black hole or something like this. Um, but generally, what we see in the astronomical world is stuff that makes light. So the question is, is there more stuff out in the, in the astronomical world that doesn't make light, that's dark matter, so to speak, that, that is, not, uh, is not participating in this make light type um, uh, uh, or even, or even uh, affect light as it comes to us. Okay, so how might one deduce that there is or isn't some dark matter in addition to the light, the, the, the luminous matter that we see? Well, the main approach is to use the gravitational effects of these things. So when you see a galaxy, for example, like our galaxy is a spiral galaxy, it's rotating, it has a certain rate of rotation. And you can, you can compute the rate of rotation based on, or you can compute how the rate of rotation changes as you go further out in the galaxy. You know, we're on a spiral arm of the galaxy and you know, we're, we're sort of far out in the galaxy and we're, we're kind of rotating at a certain speed. Um, you, can, uh, you can kind of, uh, uh, you can look at different galaxies. You can figure out how fast they're rotating as you know, going out from the center of the galaxy. And that, um, uh, and the, the calculation of that depends on how much matter there is there and how much, how much mass there is there, how much gravity that mass is producing. And from that, you can compute things like how fast the galaxy, the outer part of the galaxy should be, should be spinning, so to speak. Well, it turns out you don't get the right answer based on the, the matter that you can see in typical galaxies, the luminous matter. You don't get the answer that you think you would get. And there are much more extreme cases where there's sort of galaxies that collided and you sort of see something where there's nothing, there seems to be nothing in the middle, but yet it seems to have a gravitational effect, those kinds of things. So that's kind of the, the concept of, you know, why one thinks that there's some kind of dark matter that is having a gravitational effect, but not having an effect in terms of producing light. Now, what is the dark matter? Nobody knows. You know, there are prosaic explanations. Maybe it's burnt out stars. Maybe it's little black holes. Those are big things. Maybe it's some weird new kind of particle that is, you know, I, one thing that may come out of our theory of physics is that there may be particles much, much lighter than electrons and things like this that would have very weak interactions with other things. 
and whose only effect would be their gravitational effect. And that might be a candidate for what dark matter is. But people have had many different theories for what dark matter might be. Kind of, If you're a particle physicist, there are all kinds of little footnotes and rough edges to particle physics and to explaining how things work. Um, and sort of every one of those footnotes and rough edges, well, not everyone, but a lot of them at least, have had a dark matter candidate that sort of come out of them. Well, you know, this is a way that we could fix this particular rough edge if there was this extra particle that, by the way, would be a dark matter kind of thing. And there are a lot of um, uh, there are a lot of searches people try to do for dark matter, and they're very weird because you know, dark matter. It's kind of like, well, you don't see anything. And and for example, a typical kind of thing is a dark matter particle, if it exists, comes in and it hits something, it, you know, it knocks an atom and it knocks the electron out of the atom. And then you see that electron just suddenly start zooming off somewhere, even though there wasn't anything that sort of came in to produce that. It's a little tricky, you know, neutrinos can do things like that as well, but, uh, you know, long, long, long stories about how that would be, uh, uh, would work. And, and there are things where you can use the fact that the earth is presumably moving relative to this kind of background sort of uh, um, um, ether of dark matter. And so you can use the fact that the Earth is moving with respect to it to kind of compare different times of year and things like this to, to, to look for it. So that's kind of what dark matter is. And, you know, depending on your estimates, some large fraction of the total mass of the universe might be dark matter. Um, so that, that's, that's that story. Dark energy is actually a very different story. Um, the, the universe is expanding. We've known that since the 1920s. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, there was this big bang at the beginning of the universe that produced this kind of outward flow of, uh, of matter. And it's that outward flow that continues, the, the, the kind of the, the structure of the universe continues to expand. And as you know, different, there's this thing that's usually called the Hubble flow that is after, after Edwin Hubble, who was the guy who discovered experimentally the, the expansion of the universe. Um, the, uh, uh, that produces a little force between galaxies. So it's pulling galaxies, distant galaxies, a little bit further and further apart. That's kind of how the expansion of the universe works. You might say, well, gosh, the universe is expanding. Why am I not expanding? And if everything was expanding, we wouldn't even say the universe is expanding. In fact, in our theories of physics, it could be that everything is expanding at a pretty high rate, but we wouldn't know that because you know our measuring stick is expanding at the same rate as the thing we're measuring is expanding. And so, you know, so that isn't uh, uh, the, the, so. What really matters is that when you're when you're just here, sitting here with with you know, we're made of atoms that are held together by by pretty strong chemical forces and so on. Or um, and uh, uh, you know, we the, the the Hubble flow, the little sort of force of gravity that is pulling things apart, has no effect on our. It doesn't make us expand. It doesn't make even our whole galaxy expand. But when you get galaxies that are far enough apart, they're gravitational attraction between each other is weak enough that this kind of little force that's associated with the expansion of the universe takes over and they move further apart. And as the galaxies get further and further apart, the effective speed at which they move apart increases. So the, um, okay, so that's the, the picture there. Well, so now the question is, um, you know, how fast is the universe expanding? And can we account for the expansion rate, the slowing down of the uh, the speed of the expansion of the universe from the stuff that we see in the universe on a large scale, not talking about individual galaxies or anything, we're talking about the whole universe. And, um, uh, and the answer is, well, there are some disagreements about that. And it's, it's tricky to figure out the expansion rate. You have to kind of know when did that light that you see uh, was, was emitted by a thing that is moving away from us at a certain speed, sort of, uh, how far away is that thing that is going at such and such a speed? And the way you can tell how far away something is, is if there is kind of a, a, a something that lights up there and you know how intense, the, the intensity of the light it should produce, then you just see how intense is the light that we receive. And then you can compute from that, how far away is that sort of standard candle light? And so a typical thing that's used is supernova explosions when stars explode and it's kind of assumed that the supernovas that were happening when the universe was much younger are kind of similar to the supernovas that happen now. Not completely obvious that that's correct, but um, the, uh, if you assume that, then that provides you sort of this, this standard in intensity candle, so to speak, um, that you can use to, to separately estimate the distance 
And then you can figure out how fast the thing is going away from us um, by using a thing called Doppler shift. A Doppler shift is, is basically that the, um, we talked a bunch about frequencies of, of, of sound and light and so on. If you hear that siren coming towards you, it's higher pitch when it's coming towards you, it's lower pitch when it's going away from you. Um, and that same effect happens with light. And so that's, that's how you can tell by, by that change of frequency, you can tell how fast the thing is going relative to you. So dark energy was introduced as an idea to kind of explain why the universe isn't uh, expanding at the rate one would expect it to. And essentially what happens is that dark energy is essentially negative mass matter, where what one is doing is saying, normally gravity is an attractive force. It's always pulling things together. But if you have negative mass, well, then it will push things apart. And, and so that's kind of the idea is, well, we can't quite explain uh, sort of the expansion rate of the universe. So let's introduce this other kind of thing that's never been seen, but um, only its potential effect has been seen that sort of makes things, that sort of negative mass stuff that makes things fly apart faster. Now, you know, there's a lot of questions about whether any of this is actually right um, or whether what's really going on is something having to do with the, 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 the nature of, of uh, well, it could be the experiments about, about the expansion of the universe, although there are now several different kind of cross-checks that have been done on that. Or could it be something to do with the, what we understand about how gravity works and so on? I'm not sure. In our models of physics, one of the things, okay, so one, one of the big mysteries in, in physics is, is this. Uh, you think there's a vacuum. Most of the universe is a vacuum. You know, most of the universe, most parts of space, there's at most one atom per cubic meter. It's practically nothing there. So you think. So it's like vacuum, nothing. Well, ever since quantum mechanics was invented, it's been known that there are so-called vacuum fluctuations. That even in this thing where you say there's nothing there, there are these very briefly forming pairs of particles and antiparticles, electron and positron. Positron is the antiparticle of the electron. They're formed, they annihilate again. They're formed, they annihilate again. Happens in a, a tiny, tiny fraction of a second. It's happening all over space. And it's something that, according to quantum field theory, uh, there, there is a, uh, there's kind of a, you get sort of all frequencies of that. It's actually kind of a white noise story of, of quantum field theory, that all frequencies, all, all sort of sizes of those fluctuations occur in the vacuum. And so the problem with that is that every one of those fluctuations has a certain amount of mass and energy associated with it. And if you think that there is a gravitational effect, that those, those things, while they might have a plus charge, a minus charge, electric charge, they always have, in the usual way of thinking about it, they always have a, um, uh, a sort of positive contribution to the gravitational effect of things, because they always have you know, mass usually, apart from dark energy and so on, mass is usually positive. And so the, the, um, that implies that there's this huge, in what you think is the vacuum, it's really seething and bubbling with all these virtual particles and the, all these vacuum fluctuations that produce this, this you know, huge pile of energy, even in the vacuum. In fact, it's such a big pile of energy that it would curl the universe up into a tiny ball, maybe you know, a kilometer across or something, if you just had that vacuum energy contributing mass. So one has to sort of explain why doesn't that happen? The traditional explanations have been distinctly hokey. Um, and uh, th there's a lot of kind of, well, there's a thing that kind of cancels that that's, uh, that's associated with some other effect, like a cosmological constant that's just a term added to the equations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In, in our model of physics, it's a lot less hokey. In fact, it's not hokey at all, because in our models of physics, what happens is the actual structure of space, there is, there is inner structure to space. It's like, you know, back 150 years ago, people thought, you know, when you have a fluid like water, it was just a continuous fluid. There was nothing, there's no structure inside the water. Then people realized around the end of the 1800s that, well, actually water is made of molecules. And there's discrete structure. There's actually things in the water that make up the water. And this thing that seems to us like a fluid is made from all these molecules bouncing around and colliding with each other and so on. Well, I think that's kind of the way space works as well. And we have pretty good evidence, I think, from our models of physics that you know, we built in the last few years that, um, uh, that space should be thought of as this just giant collection of discrete points. And every point, 
just has, in a sense, some, some friends, some point friends, so to speak. It just knows what other points it's connected to. It doesn't know where it is because there's no space yet. It just knows I'm connected to these other points here. And the thing is that when you do that, you build up this giant network of points. And when you have a sufficiently large network, as far as an entity like us, sort of embedded within the system, it, it seems like it's, a, it's like continuous space of the kind that we're used to seeing. So that's, you know, that, in, in that picture, what's happening is that that space, the fact that different points are connected to each other, that is coming about because there are continual rewrites. There are continual changes, local changes in this network. And the fact that the network doesn't fall apart is a consequence of the fact that there are always these continual changes. So in a sense, there's, there's activity in the network that is knitting together the structure of the network. In fact, if we think about sort of what's happening in our universe, the vast, vast majority of all the activity of the universe has to do with knitting together the structure of space. It's kind of like we were talking about vortices and fluids and things like that. For a fluid, the vast majority of sort of what's going on in the fluid is molecules bouncing around at a very small scale, you know, and going, you know, a millionth of a meter before they hit another molecule and so on. That's, that's most of what's happening in a fluid. But for us, looking at a fluid on a large scale, we say, oh, we care about the vortices, the tornadoes, whatever else. Um, but that's something, you know, that's a, that's a little tiny effect on top of this big effect of just sort of the, uh, the molecules in the fluid bouncing around. And so it is with space, I think, that the vast majority of the activity of, of the universe has to do with kind of the way that space is formed, the knitting together of the structure of space, and the things that we're used to, like electrons and photons, all those kinds of things, are little, little uh, sort of fluctuations on top of uh, little structures like vortices in a fluid, little structures on top of that underlying kind of bubbling uh, mass of, of things that knit together the structure of space. So in our models, you don't really have this problem of, of space has a gravitational effect on itself because space is this effect that is essentially generating this energy density in space. In our models, energy is basically the density of activity in a system. What's happening is that there's a, the, that activity is what knits together the structure of space. And so it doesn't sort of come from the outside and then have an effect on space. It's all kinds of comes together. And that means that sort of space is knitted together by all of this. And so space is what it is after that. And that's kind of, that's kind of the way that, that that works. And I think that the, uh, so when you ask about something like dark energy, um, what would be happening there in our models is there's sort of less activity in some part of the network than there is in other parts. So most of the universe, there'd be some density of energy that is sort of the, the usual zero of energy. But some places there'd be a little less activity going on. And so those places would seem like they have negative mass, negative energy. Um, the, uh, um, uh, and so, so, so that, um, that, that's the way that works. All right. Let's see. Well, I think I'm supposed to go to something else here. I'm not feeling as sick as I thought I was going to feel. So uh, thank you guys for, for energizing me and, and uh, sending those viruses packing, perhaps. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, well, let's see if there's anything else I can, I can um, quickly tackle. Uh, these are not quick questions. They're good questions and interesting questions, but they're not quick questions. Um, actually, uh, well, Doug was asking, does dark matter interact with gravity? Yes, the answer is yes. Um, that's sort of its point. Um, then uh, David is asking, if dark matter particles exist, why are there no dark matter halos associated with the sun and planet Jupiter? That is a good question. I would assume that the answer is this. Uh, in, okay, it depends on if dark matter is made of particles, really depends what the mass of those particles is, how those particles will behave. And the issue is, uh, okay, so if the particles are very light, they will tend to be zipping around very quickly. If they're zipping around very quickly, they won't be caught in the gravitational wells of things like the sun and Jupiter. So they'll kind of just be smoothed out all over the place. If the things are, are quite massive, 
one would expect them to be caught there, I think. I'm trying to think whether there's a reason they wouldn't be. Ah, uh, yes, I know there's another problem. The other problem is this. If you are zipping around the universe and you're having some gravitational effect, hmm, uh, maybe not. Okay, what I was going to say is this. Uh, if you're going to be caught in, you know, you're going to be caught by a star and you're going to start orbiting the star, as you go past the star, you are, you're bent, you know, your trajectory is bent by the, um, uh, let's see, how would this work? Um, I'm thinking that you have to lose energy. Um, let's see, how does that work? Maybe not, maybe not. I, I think, okay, my, my, my thought, and I have to think about it more carefully, is that in order to be caught in the gravitational well, you have to lose energy, and that if you're a sufficiently non-interacting thing, it's hard for you to uh, sort of get rid of that additional energy, additional kinetic energy that you have. Not sure if that's right. Um, the uh, okay, I'm going to do one last question, and then then I need to need to go. Uh, last question I'm going to do is from Wabu. What's a graviton? Okay, so since we're talking about gravity and all those kinds of things, I can try and tell you what a graviton is. So uh, light is, uh, we can think of light as a stream of photons, a stream of discrete packets of electromagnetic energy. Light can be thought of in different ways. You can think of light as kind of a wave where you've got uh, an intensity of uh, electrical intensity, magnetic intensity. You have this kind of thing that's just uh, electric field, magnetic field, that that is a thing that's just sort of exists in space and the way the equations, Maxwell's equations work, you get these electric field, magnetic field and at right angles. And that is a thing that sort of propagates as a wave through space. And that's kind of a, a wave version of, of what uh, light, electromagnetic energy, uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation is. But there's an alternative view, which says that actually it's um, that uh, really you can think of it instead as discrete lumps of electromagnetic energy that are photons. And there are cases where the photon picture is definitely the one that's that's most obvious. Like, for example, very early one, uh, one of Einstein's early uh, discoveries, I think, of the photoelectric effect, where, uh, you know, one photon of light comes in and it ejects one electron from the metal. And it's kind of like very much there's a discrete thing that comes in and it produces a discrete effect. So one can think of of um, uh, electromagnetism as, you know, electromagnetic light, for example, is broken into a bunch of photons. Um, we can also think of it as a wave that comes about from the, from the collective effect of a very large number of photons. The total number of photons in typical, uh, you know, typical little piece of light will be uh, absolutely huge. And so uh, wh when you get to things like gamma rays and so on, you can have one photon can pack a bit more, bit more of a punch, and it's more, more obvious that they're, they're sort of discrete photons. Okay, so for gravity, it's the same kind of thing. Uh, for gravity, there are gravitational waves. There are distortions in space-time that uh, were about five years ago finally detected by actually looking at how sort of basically a, a, um, uh, a thing that's supposed to be this long, when a gravitational wave which distorts space-time goes through it, it becomes a different length. And you can detect those tiny changes of length, and that's how you detect the fact that the structure of space-time is changing as a result of having a gravitational wave. But there's a different view of gravity, which says, just like with electromagnetism, instead of it being the case that there is uh, you know, these waves, you think of it as broken into these discrete lumps of gravitational energy called gravitons. No one's ever seen a graviton. Gravitons would be pretty hard to detect because they interact very weakly with things. And only when you have a, a, just a huge torrent of gravitons that would be like a gravitational wave or something like that would you see their effects. Gravitons have a lot of funky features. They interact with each other because each graviton has energy. That energy has an effect on other, has a gravitational effect on other gravitons. So gravitons interact with each other. Photons pretty much don't interact with each other because they don't have electric charge. Um, but gravitons do have energy. And so they produce a gravitational effect on each other. And gravitons, people have tried to sort of make theories that are like the theories of quantum, quantum field theories 
of electromagnetism, where you're talking about photons and electrons and so on, they tried to make those theories with gravitons. Those theories have a nasty habit of blowing themselves up mathematically um, and uh, uh, are not really making sense. There are sort of some hacks around that using this idea of supersymmetry, where you say, in addition to the graviton, there's the gravitino and a whole bunch of other particles, which uh, wherever the graviton can sort of make things blow up, those other particles make things anti-blow up and they perfectly cancel each other out. But in the usual case, you know, we, we haven't seen gravitons and gravitons will be hard to detect. Um, and uh, I think in our models of physics, there absolutely are gravitons and um, there is uh, a certain, uh, well, there'll be gravitons, but, but as you look at, um, very high frequency gravitons, very small gravitons, comparable to the size, the elementary length going between different elements of space, all sorts of funky things will happen. Just like when you uh, try and send an electromagnetic wave through a crystal, because in a crystal there are atoms of definite separations, there, there are different things that happen to those waves as a result of there being sort of a, 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 a sort of discrete lattice of atoms. The same types of things will happen in space time. And so one would expect to see some funky effects um, for high frequency gravitational waves propagating through uh, discrete, this sort of discrete underlying space time. And there are some other funky effects to do with um, uh, kind of discreteness noise associated with rapidly rotating black holes, other, other things like that, that are kind of, kind of more complicated to describe. But um, uh, you know, the graviton is a particle that's never been seen, but it's sort of uh, theoretically a way to describe how gravity works is it's a stream of gravitons being exchanged between things, just as electromagnetism is kind of a stream of photons being exchanged between things. Gravitons have, you know, it's, there's certain characteristics of them are known, like a photon is a spin one particle, a graviton is a spin two particle, and that has consequences for the fact that, for example, uh, for photons, like charges repel, unlike charges attract, that's a spin one characteristic, for spin two, uh, all, all, you know, like the, the, um, there are only things always attract and so on. All right, I think I need to go. Uh, thank you all and um, see you another time. I hope to have um, routed the virus by next time. And uh, uh, until then, bye for now.